Thank you, guys. Yeah. Hello, guys. This is Vandana. I am a Linux kernel engineer. I have been working with Linux kernel like more than two decades, 20, 24 years. And I've worked on various subsystems as such more. Uh, and not uh, just limited to device drivers. Uh, in case of device drivers, I work with uh, embedded systems, associated uh, ARM-based developments, uh, as well as networking device drivers, uh, network subsystem storage, as well as the other subsystems related to memory management and security as such. So here in today's session, what we are going to do is going to look at the kernel tracing functionality, some of the how to look into the kernel uh, activities that are happening and um, that when using the APB framework as such. So to get started with, let me give you an overall idea of what, what this today's topic is going to consider, uh, contain and how we are going to proceed with this. So the agenda is to move from, start with the basics of the uh, uh, framework, understand the architecture and then look at how this framework is more valuable or useful compared to the existing architecture, existing tracing functionality as such, and the way it has been used for doing the dynamic and the static instrumentation, um, particularly as the session is more for the kernel tracing, we'll look at the kernel instrumentation techniques, and then we'll look at um, from time to time, to time I, I try I tend to use the tools that are part of this BPF tool, uh, tool chain as such that help to demonstrate some of the features uh, uh, and functionalities that can be traced or the data can be collected from the kernel using these tools and uh, tenderly use some BCC tools or BF, uh, BF uh, BPF uh, trace tool, as well as the programming using the BPF programs as such. So the overall scope and expectation you can have is the high level introduction to this uh, architecture and the how the uh, tracing can be done with the help of this uh, set of tools, as well as from the programming as such. And I'll also provide the useful pointers for the information that has been referenced as such, okay? So to start with, uh, let's have a bit of background of uh, BPF, that is the Berkeley Packet Filter Framework, which was originally being created to speed up the filtering of the network packets as such. And, with, uh, and eventually um, uh, in 2014, Alexei uh, redesigned the whole of this BPF framework, the language of the BPF framework, adding extensible functionality to it such that um, it turned into a more generic, uh, general purpose execution engine, uh, and which was uh, not limited only to packet filtering, but more functionality was being added to perform a variety of operations, such as profiling uh, uh, or debugging or enforcing the security policies as well. So some of the features that got included with the efforts uh, that has gone into 3.18 kernel included like a introduction of this BPF system call that would be used to load the BPF, various BPF programs that would uh, potentially do the different functionality of profiling, debugging, and hooking up at the various kernel functionality as such. And based on those uh, different hook, hookups, uh, there is the set load being added for different types of programs, not limiting to the packet filtering as such. And that's how the BPF framework evolved to what we call as a, uh, now we call as extended BPF functionality, eBPF as such. So basically, um, BPF or eBPF, they are like interchangeably being used as such. So, uh, EBFIF is basically a, a revolutionary te kernel technology that allows the developer to be, uh, to customize or uh, customize the code that uh, once when it is loaded um, loaded dynamically into the kernel and that would help that would potentially change the way the kernel behaves means if you want to uh, perform something additional as uh, to the kernel code that is there lo loaded dynamically, then that can be achieved through the BPF programming as well. 
So basically, it provides a more flexibility to add, uh, to build up the tools, uh, tools uh, or to customize the policies as such. And that is run, uh, dyna uh, dynamic runtime as such. So basically, the tools that are based on APBF, they are, uh, they are being developed and they have been evolved to do the uh, Mm -hmm. They potentially observe the events, any kind of events that are happening across the kernel, as well as up applications, either on the virtual hardware or physical hardware, or in, even you know, in the containerized environment. Basically, in a short, what we can say that uh, BPF is a technology that composed of the instruction set that is the BPF program that is to be run. Then the storage objects, at how the uh, information, if it is collected information, and if it is shared between the user space and kernel, then that information. And the set of helper function that helps collect this information or to uh, write the policies or how that behavior kernel functionality can be changed. The, there are the set of library functions that has been defined uh, in uh, uh, define as such that means that, that those things can be taken help by this life help functions. So basically, it can be considered as a virtual machine running in a totally isolated environment as such. So why this eBPF is important? Um, the, for that, let's look at the. Um, no the difference between the basic behavior uh, kernel and the user space in Linux. Right? As we are aware that the application they run in the un unprivileged layer called user space means which does not have to direct access to the hardware as such. And in that case, the applications make use of system call to make the to request the kernel to do uh, its work on its behalf as such. And basically that might be like accessing the hardware or changing some policies as such. So like reading, writing file or sending, receiving packets yeah. or accessing memory or allocating memory and several other activities. So that all that application from the user space that is done by invoking the system calls. And whereas like the kernel, it runs in their privilege layer and acts as a you know, bridge between the application and hardware. Uh, basically, it provides the abstraction of the hardware, uh, physical or virtual as such. And that is done through the set of the system subsets or layers handling all those different uh, resources. And each of these subsets typically allows for some level of configuration. Uh, uh, level of configuration uh, based on the needs of the users as such. So. Like uh, if the desired behavior is not been configured in the kernel as such, then or if it is not pr uh, present uh, as such, or it is like some more changes are needed to the uh, current uh, functionality as such. So the uh, the way it can be done, uh, the kernel change would be needed to add add that support, and it has been particularly defaulted to the two approaches. That was uh, adding the native support, that is adding the change into the kernel, or like adding the change uh, in such a way that it can be dynamically loaded, whereby taking the functionality of kernel modules as such. So each 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 of this method has its both pros and cons as such. Like if there's some change has to be added into the kernel, mm -hmm. that is a net make it as a native support as such. Then the change has to be implemented, and then uh, it goes through these uh, iterative cycles of reviews with the uh, kernel community. It means you have to convince the kernel community what that change is necessary as such. And after several iteration and waiting, then that change might get uh, would get reviewed and accepted and then available in upstream. So there is like a waiting cycle uh, if the change has to go in uh, as a native as a message. Whereas like uh, 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 another option is the kernel module where you make the changes as form of kernel module. And the downside is like you need to maintain maintain that change. Uh, uh, and fix like as and when the kernel changes or the APIs that are being used, their changes as such. And also there is a risk of uh, corrupting the kernel. 
your system if it has not been implemented properly and uh, having some uh, security issues as such. So in that case, uh, that option might not be always workable as such. So that's where we have this another functionality that comes through the BPO framework, which allows the behavior of the kernel or which allows to add this functionality without making changes to the kernel sources or loading the kernel module. And taking the help of this functionality, we would be going using this functionality to do some tracing, tracing of the subsystems as such. Okay. So here, this is a um, uh, block diagram or simplified way of uh, pro uh, projecting how this architecture can be viewed as such BPF architecture. So here, uh, the, the, the code that you want to load, uh, load and run in the kernel, they, they have been implemented as uh, BPF programs. And this paper programs can be loaded dynamically uh, and executed in the kernel as such. So when these programs are dynamically loaded and executed, there are uh, there are they are the components of this framework that ensures that ensures the security and safety of the program that is to be loaded at runtime as such. So that's where this BPF verifier component it does the work of ensuring the programs are safe and cache free. And it does, does some work of checking uh, whether it's breaking the security policy in some way, like the program would be rejected if it is uh, deemed to be unsafe, such as like uh, some of the uh, features that is considered as unsafe is not as having, if the program has infinite uh, or loop for loop uh, as such, or uh, backward branches and those kind of uh, functions. So the program has that kind of functionality and the verifier would reject it as such. Once the verifier ensures that the program can be loaded and that they have the another component is the engine compile just in time compiler. Basically it does the work of translating the bytecode into the uh, machine level instruction that would be executed as such. And once that is done, the program is attached to that particular function or particular event as such. And as and when that particular event occurs, then that program would be triggered as such. And uh, like when these programs are being designed, they are being designed to provide some functionality as well as collect some data as such. And so for collecting the data, uh, this one of the, cons the constraint construct being developed is called as the BPF maps as such, which basically provides the facility ability to store the collected information and um, share between the user space and the kernel space. And based on the requirement, like there are different types of maps, like hash tables, arrays, buffers, stack and stack trace, as such, and of course there are a lot many other as such. So here in this case, this example is um, this particular by a program. Uh, it is uh, it is to be attached for a, but this network related system calls as such. So here in this case, the programs get attached to send message and receive message. We'll see how this has been done with the examples as such. And uh, whenever the applications makes the socket program, so network programs that calls the socket, socket system calls, in that case, that uh, particular BP program would be executed as such. So yeah, so here we talk about loading the BP program, which is done dynamically as such. And this program can be loaded and removed. Uh, from the kernel dynamically. And once they are attached to the event, the, um, uh, they are triggered regardless of the cause of the event as such. So it can be caused by any application or maybe a, a process getting executed or maybe process communicating with each other, any such. But if that particular event has been triggered, then that EPF program would be executed. 
and uh, uh, the programs they can be attached to, at various places at uh, various hooks as such uh, to give some of the examples like the system calls or any kernel functions as such it can be particularly like if you say system call like the entry uh, system call entry or system call exit similarly for the other kernel function entry exit can be or the, uh, can, the these programs can be attached. Again, another uh, is the trace trace points, the various trace points that are there. Uh, then the different uh, subsystems, particular network events or other uh, events, other subsystem events. They, this uh, uh, BPF programs can be attached as such. So to give an example, like uh, the PPF program can be attached to the open system call entry point, uh, entry of the open system call. And whenever any application tries to open a file onto the system, then this BPF program would be executed as such. Or another example as per this diagram to say that the BPF program is attached to the exact system call. Like whenever a new application is executed, wherever it is, then this program would be executed and based on what functionality has been implemented in this BP program that would be executed. So basically, you know, like uh, one way is like using the helper function and the various constructs, the uh, arguments passed to those system calls can be collected or the credential process credentials can be collected. So from the observability point of view, the, uh, uh, the system observability can be done like what's happening uh, on the system and who is doing what and how the information, how the parameters are being passed. So all that thing can be collected in the, in the con collected through this BPA program. And, as needed, the changes could be made as such. So basically, with this functionality, uh, this this leads to one of the uh, greatest trends, like of observability, observing or uh, uh, observability or security tools that uh, that uh, tool tooling that can be done using the BPA framework as such. So basically what it does, like it gives you the instant visibility or everything what is happening onto the system as such. So BPO framework is one of the latest uh, framework that has been used for this observability and the security tools as such that you can enforce the security uh, policies using this BPO framework. So, oh yeah, so this is the way the dynamic loading and programming can help to get you the uh, get you into the system uh, into the system know what is the health of the system or what exactly the system is up to as such. Also, like find figuring out some debugging issues or performance issues that can very well be are done with the help of this BPF programming as such. So here in this case, before getting into the details, what we would go, we, we could come uh, uh, run back and forth with the examples as such. Uh, at, at this point, you might not to get all this, um, each of the function that has been used, or it might be like you are already using, but like to start with, what we'll do is like, uh, just go through a program called Hello World, Prograting Program, Hello World. Uh, written in a Python, uh, Python code as such, and how, with the help of this Python code, how the BPF program can be attached to some system call, and then see how this system call can be invoked as such. Okay, so basically, the Python program can be considered as, um, uh, let me say, It consists of two parts as such, like, um, oh yeah, uh, like it contains the actual uh, BPF program and then the, uh, then the Python code that does the work of loading the, uh, loading the BPF program into onto the kernel as such, compiling and loading as such. Okay, so here in this case, uh, 
to really discover a slide and then go back to the code as such. So uh, as we said that it consists of two parts, that is the ABB program that will run in the kernel. So it's just basically nothing but a C, a C function as such, and it has a simple helper function that does the work of printing. It's similar to print key as such. So here it is the BPF uh, trace print key doing a hello world print as such. Okay, so this all this all together is your BPF program, so which is a C like functionality as such. And the rest of the part is the Python code. So the Python program that does the work of loading the BPF program. And basically the uh, BPF tools, tool chain that is BCC, one of the two that does the work of, of compiling the C code uh, before executing it and then loading it into the kernel. And then uh, it attaches to a particular uh, event as such. So here in this example, uh, taken exact system call as such k proof function. Okay, so you're looking at this diagram, like the year this is your uh, program Python code, which when executed, what it does, it does the work of loading the BPF program onto, into the kernel. Uh, and uh, that, loading and attaching it to a particular event that would be triggered as such. And whenever that event uh, is triggered, whenever the applications as such makes a call as such, like an exact system call application, new application is executed, then the exact system call gets executed and at every uh, execution exact system call, the BP program will be executed. And whatever the functionality it has done now here, in our case, it is nothing but a print statement. So it, it prints this um, um, string as such, so which has been collected uh, in some kernel buffer and which is passed back to the application means it prints that on the screen as such. So, uh, how, 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 okay, let me go back to the code as such. Okay, so here, this is the, we define the BPF program. And then the rest of the Python code does the work of initializing this BPF program uh, by creating the BPF object as such. And then, uh, uh, then we choose to attach this BPF program to the, exact system called event as such. So here, these are the set of helper functions that have been used as such. Now here, uh, the exact system call uh, is to be used. So here, what we do is we tend to make use of the help function to get the function corresponding to the exact system call as such. So, and then this exact system call function name, uh, we try to create, uh, we uh, try to attach it to the, uh, attach uh, this, um, attach the function, the function that we the program that has been defined to this uh, exact system called event as such. And that has been done using the capable functionality as such. And once that is done, then the print, print, uh, trace print does the work of, uh, outputting the you know, cross trace put output by the kernel as such, and it would eventually go and show up on the screen as such. So basically, uh, uh, to go and say, basically the output is been stored into a zero file as such. So uh, this, uh, the running, uh, running this program, uh, so uh, like depending on the what the load is there, what is happening on the system, what the different types of application that are running, and whenever they make an exact system call, then that is this event would be triggered as such, and then you would see this hello world string as such. So here in this case, uh, what we'll do is 
will just uh, execute some command as such, PS command, and then we see if we are getting anything printed. So here we see that there is one more print as such, and let's do ls. So again, you see, so here in this case, when we are uh, on the another terminal, uh, some application has been, a process has been start, uh, executing. So that execution happens to the exact system call as such. So whenever that has been tracked through this Python code as such, Python, Python application, which has uh, loaded the BPF program uh, to trigger the events whenever the exact system call is executed. So when we are doing that on another terminal, we get to see a log being generated that through the printer uh, statement as such. And here you get to see this hello world uh, string as such, as part of that, okay? And uh, also you get to see, it's not just the string that is coming, but there is other, other contextual information as such, particularly like the PID process name and the process ID as such. So uh, basically, uh, this output that is coming, that is actually coming from the from that pseudo file or from the kernel log. That is the that that basically what it does. The Python that goes and reads this uh, trace pipe uh, uh, pseudo file as such. The all the those traces are then fetched from that as such. And uh, another part information we can note down as the other contactual information. So that is basically, uh, that is basically, uh, that is added by the kernel tracing framework as an infrastructure as such. And giving the information process ID and process name and other information. So it's not very specific to BPF as such, but it's a part of a tracing, uh, uh, tracing framework functionality as such. Okay. So this is like a very simple hello world kind of application. So we just control C and terminate it as such. So here you uh, you define an, uh, uh, so here the programs are defined uh, as a C function and it has been passed to the BPF object as a string as such. So you, you just pass the whole of this function, uh, creating the BPF, initialize the BPF and then um, the set with the uh, function, help functions, you would uh, go and attach the BP program to this particular event as such. Uh, that might be set of system calls, uh, then uh, trace points of events and other events as such. And basically, here we are particularly using the K proof functionality. Which is like which is used for doing the uh, dynamic instrumentation as such, and then there are other ways the events can be attached as such. So this like getting started helps with this. Now one more thing that uh, this trace pipe uh, is here actually uh, you, you can uh, open this file and see that you would be able to see the trace. Uh, uh, output as such. So basically, this does the um, spores, uh, uh, spores the information that is a string based or simple strings as such. But at times, the based on the functionality and how the a uh, people programming has to be done to do a lot of other operations as such. Now we are what we, we are do, not doing anything as such, but in real use case. A lot of data uh, data is being shared with the, from the kernel to the application, and based on that data, the uh, uh, corresponding actions are to be taken. So in that case, the stress pipe might not be a sufficient mechanism for getting the data as such. So for therefore, this uh, BPF maps are being used as such. Which are uh, which is a um, data structure that has been accessed from the user space as well as kernel space um, from the EPA programs and as well as from the user space and basically it provides uh, or, or key value stores as such. So if the data is being shared, it has to be shared. It's like in a some structure data structure as such maybe like a socket socket structure or network packet as such. So in that case, um, 
you cannot use this trace pipe. It would be uh, inefficient for tracing or scanning that output as such. So by making use of the BPF maps and that, that information, maybe whole structure or uh, nested structures and related information, they, they are being shared. In that case, this BPF map is a, a useful constraint to be used. And based on the requirements and the definition, there are different types of BPF maps that are implemented. You can figure out that in the BPF.hf file. And it was commonly that has been used are the hash tables, swing buffers, arrays, and various others as such. And also, like there are other types, the different types defined based on the type of operation, like FIFO, FIFO use stacks and listener use data, LRU data source as such. And um, also, like based on the different uh, subsystems or information specific, like particularly for the networking as such, there are different uh, BPF uh, maps that are being constructed for doing this sort of a storing and sharing the socket and network device information. So this is just an example of a socket and network device, the SOC maps and the dev maps as such. So we'll see some of the examples how this uh, ma maps are being used as such. Yeah. Vandana, so, um, yeah. is there are several questions in the yeah. chat uh, that okay. probably would be better answered if you can um yes. take a break if not let me know we'll we'll get to the questions later okay let me okay know. yeah so you will i think the first uh, question is i think there are a lot of conversation happening here uh, some of the questions are answered let me, okay let me... I, I did not <laughs> look at them no that's okay. okay that's okay yeah. i i'm watching but i thought that i would wait for a good stopping point and okay. kind of yeah. found one I thought, but okay. The first question is uh, from Praveen. Um, I would like to know how if eBPF can help when applications need DPDK networking, like some user plane might need DPDK. I'm sorry, can you repeat? I happen to. Okay. So uh, if uh, I would like to know how if eBPF can help when applications need DPDK? Um, it would have been great, I think, if uh, Praveen could expand what DPDK is, but I'm say, thinking that it's a um, device, some kind of um, API. DPDK networking, like some user plane yeah. might need DPDK. Yeah. Yeah, DPDK is, uh, provides the uh, user space networking uh, mm -hmm programming as such altogether. So basically, I think for the DPDK, we have, uh, for that, uh, from the networking point of view, there is the XDP interface is there in part of the BPF, where uh, the network traffic uh, acceleration paths are, data, uh, data paths are, accelerations are being done. So BPF has the support for that as well. So uh, most of the things that is related to networking, I think that go, that goes to the XDP interface as such. And that can be leveraged in the in DPDK stack as, as such. Mm. Hope that answered your question, Praveen. If not, um, please uh, um, uh, post a question in Q&A yeah. uh, yeah. or chat. So this next question is, does eBPF assume a physical machine or can it run well on virtual machine too? I think this question has been answered and yeah, people yeah. came back and said it can be done on both yes, um, as yes. long as kernel supports it. Um, right. So the other question is, does someone know the difference between DTrace and EP, eBPF? I think this is also answered that um, DTrace is only available on Solaris and Oracles, and it's not yes, um, yeah. in the mainline kernel. I think right. uh, that's been answered. Let me see. Yeah. Um, it looks like a hook environment between user mode and kernel mode. How does this work with LSM, for example, Cell Linux? So I think the this probably in reference to uh, the Python program 
that you are doing, hooking it to the exec B. Um, so that is the question there about specific to that. So, yeah, uh, so particularly for LSM hooks, there is the new constraints that has been added in the BPO framework, that is a BPO or LSM, which can help you to add the hooks into the LSM, means it can help you to attach the programs to the LSM, LSM hooks uh, uh, as such. Okay. And, and that is one sub, 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 sub component of the BPF. This is, I think, the latest kernel support start. Mm -hmm. BPF LSM. Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So that kind of makes it more secure, um, yes. especially Selenix kind of use uh, BPF methods to um, trace and then uh, attach hooks. Okay. Yes. Yeah. That right. Sounds, right. That sounds good. Uh, would slides be shared? Yes, they will be shared after the session. And uh, we run a fleet of, how are you doing on time? Do you want to continue and take the questions later, Vandana? There seem to be more uh, questions. Yeah, okay. Actually, I've lost the track of the questions as such. So <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, should, should I uh, stop by and uh, look at the questions as such? Uh, no, I can, I can keep going, reading questions, okay. but I just wanted to see okay. if you want to. I think if you can read read out the question, then I, I would uh, try to okay. elaborate it now. Otherwise, it will like the list might grow and then. Uh, <laughs> yep, absolutely. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, let me read the next one then. Uh, we're on a fleet of Linux VMs, thinking of building a health monitoring service based on eBPF complete with eBPF and dashboards. General idea is to provide periodic pulse of interesting metrics. Brendan Gregg's checklist plus on-demand deep dive on interesting processes. Any thoughts on that idea? Yeah, actually, uh, means that is like the current um, requirement or the current trend that I would say that has been used for the security-based product assets, where the security-based products where. Uh, uh, the, the the previous traditional security products uh, based products were like using the functionality that's uh, doing the uh, collecting the security information on the user space applications as such using the audit framework and other things as such. so they do help to get the information but they have some drawbacks or uh, downside that not all the information has been available and uh, another reason for that you had to get into the have to be in a kernel kernel space to get all that information and thanks to this bpo framework which helps you to run the application from the user space and collect the kernel information as i you can go and look at any kernel function and get that information so uh, leveraging this functionality is like a key milestone for the security security solutions as such. Mm -hmm. So like um, giving a simple example, like a security application, like file mo monitoring tool, the security solution is basically like I had worked on one of the products in uh, previous like uh, security uh, file, file system, file, oh, sorry, file monitoring system. Like uh, uh, the application was user space, adding the events, trigger the events for system calls, various tests, system calls. And, for uh, checking the check, uh, keeping a check on the uh, configuration files as such and all that. And that RDD framework did, did help to get the information, but had some limitations. And at time, not all the information was available. But I think with the APBF framework, uh, you can get a very detailed information about the system calls as well as the whole of the system or the process execution with along with the credentials and the all, all that. Uh, uh, all, all that information by using this various uh, interfaces and collect huge, uh, rich environment data as such, and then that can be interpolated and uh, 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 that can be interpolated as well to check not the, just the security or also like if there are any vulnerabilities or some attack or compromise has been happening as such. So definitely, APBF is the very right answer for that solution as such. Great, thank you. 
Um, so I think in this regard, in regards to cell and X, um, LSM and so on, I think it works. The question is, I think it works with cell and X as far as I know, unless you hit something that is blocked by the policy, the default cell and X is targeted. Yeah, so SL, with the help of SLNX, we can enforce the uh, different security policies as such. So, uh, so yes, like if the SLNX has been enabled as such, and the SLNX hooks they are at the point, uh, at the point of system call entries as such. So there is a flow of like where the SLNX goes and checks as whether whether particular operation is permitted, permitted or not based on the policies that have been loaded. The mandatory action access control has been enforced as such. Mm -hmm. So here in this case, uh, uh, the uh, BPA program has to be aligned with the SLA policies that are there running. It's like, suppose you are running a BPA program. So uh, as a, uh, what do you say, as an administrator or as a uh, uh, enforcement that you are doing that you would be doing and compliant with what are the configuration that is there as such. Okay. What is the significance of R on the program line in the Python program that you showed, Vandana? Sorry, can you repeat the question? Um, yes, the question is, what is the significance of R um, quote Quotes on the program equal to line. Uh, okay, in yeah, the Python that is, program, the, mm -hmm. yeah. Basically, it is like uh, it is passing the whole of the program to the Python. Python, basically, the Python program at the back end, the by uh, the BPO framework tool chain, it takes this code, C code, and it does the work of converting into the bytecode, and then. Uh, which would be going through the BPF framework as such to be loaded as such. And this, like if you go back to this diagram, so here in this, the Python uh, code, basically to load that uh, code, a BPF program, it goes through the system called BPF uh, system call as such. So that code has to be converted, has to be passed, which would be, uh, which would be converted into a byte code from the white code into the machine machine language, machine language as such, which would be attached to the event as such. So that for that purpose, that is the convention to specify. Uh, this, this is basically we are specifying that this is the BPA program as such. And then we uh, pass it that whole program as a string as such to the BPF uh, object. Okay. Um, and then I think this is more of a comment from somebody responding to another question about hooking. If you are uh, using eBPF to look at system calls, then it looks like a hook environment between user and kernel. Sure. However, UBF, eBPF can also be attached to purely kernel level functions. Is there anything that you would like to add to that, Vandana? Uh, other than the system call? Sorry. I um, okay. Let me read it again. If using EB, eBPF to look at the system calls, then it looks like a hook environment between user and kernel mode. However, eBPF can also be attached to purely kernel level functions. Yes, yes, yes. Means it can be attached to not just not limited to the system calls, but to any kernel functions. Okay. So that's that's correct. So that's um, where this tracing is uh, helpful as such. Like means we can we will not only be tracing system calls as such, but any kernel function that like you might be developing some kernel module, some kernel driver as such, and you might want to have look into the tracing, the functionality, maybe some performance issues or some other debugging issues in that case, uh, that, that can be done through this BPA programs as such. Or maybe you are debugging a problem and you want to see a particular system yes. call is hit. Yes. Or right. not right. system call, particular kernel interface is hit. Yes, um, yes, yes. During the Basically, there are like a lot of uh, a lot of uh, help functions are being defined as part of this BPA framework as such that uh, caters you to the different system subsystems as such, networking, clock layer, volume, volume layer, memory management as such. We will see that in the following slides as well. 
So one more question here. Um, one concern could be performance impacts if used for regular monitoring instead of occasional debugging. Perhaps that will be covered in the stock. I, I think you probably will touch on that later, Vandana. So do you want to address yeah, this yeah. question now or you have slides on that? Yeah, so I'll just give you over your like BPF programs, like they are being loaded, uh, means converted from whiteboard to the uh, assembly or machine level. So, so they uh, the overhead is significantly very less as much. Uh, uh, means not very a lot of things, but like if it has been added into the places which is like been triggered, like suppose you are adding the BPF program to a scheduler as such or monitor, uh, which would be uh, which would trigger which would be called consistently based on the workload as such. If the, if the workload uh, uh, is heavy and um, potentially the points have been, uh, the events have been triggered from that particular workload uh, related information, then in that case, there would be uh, some overheads. As such. So there are some folks that are uh, generating, or uh, yet uh, there are some folks that are potentially having a more overheads, but overall the the way the BPA programs are loaded and kind of, uh, kind of done, a, uh, what do you say, just in time uh, uh, conversion and uh, machine machine instructions are executed. So there are minimal minimal overhead as such in general. There's another question about the secure bit have any negative impact to a BPF program and then also any kernel lockdowns. So the yeah, so one thing is like these programs they are for running from the user space that is loaded. So uh, as per the what do you say the architecture, uh, BPF architecture, it has this verifier that would do the work of a verifying that the code that is going to be run in the kernel that uh, would not put the kernel in the in a in a infinite looping or a lock state as such so one of the way that would be triggered is by having the a loop as such so if, if the program has been implemented such way that is going and checking a loop as such then that kind of code is not to be allowed as such so those some some of those checks are been done taken care of by the verifier Okay, uh, I think one more and after that, maybe um, uh, we can hold off on the questions and let you complete. Um, okay. Could any ABI compatible language be used since C seems to be the de facto language to use like Zig or even C Python? Yeah, we are coming to that slide next. Okay. All right. So um, at this point, I, we do have questions in the chat and then also Q&A, but I would like to have Vandana continue her presentation um, at this time. So we will get to your questions uh, at the next stopping point. Yeah. Go ahead, Vandana. Thank you. So yeah, with uh, having a basic uh, understanding of the BPF program, what we would do now is look at the, how the that program how that uh, BPA framework can be used for doing the tracing of the kernel functionality as such. So basically the broad, basic broad understanding that with the help of tracing, it can be used for debugging and troubleshooting the uh, various issues as such. And um, the, traditionally there are, there are the various tools that are available as such, like the F-Trace uh, doing the function tracing of tool as such. And at the user space S trace, so there is a system called trace and L trace as such. So basically, these are functions. These tools are also helpful based on the use cases as such. But if you want to dive deep dive into every aspect of the kernel system that is going on, that's where we make use of the BP of functionality as such. And uh, these tools can be used along with uh, the BP of uh, framework to. Uh, explore uh, more information as such. So here in this case, so we will look into how the uh, tracing can be done with the help of a BVF framework. 
as we know that the tracing gives us the full uh, visibility of the um, across the full software stack and it allows to create the data for profiling for debugging and troubleshooting as such so this is the slide the uh, di uh, diagram from the greg Bregman's, uh, blogs as such uh, so here in this case, um, this notes down the different um, subsystems uh, in the kernel, uh, in the kernel, and I also uh, the various uh, layers in, at the application level uh, from from which the <coughs> information or from which the tracing can be done as such. So if you talk about the kernel subsystem, then the information visibility can be. Uh, we can get more visibility from the system call system call interface layer as well as file system and the, the virtual file system layer is this uh, pertaining to whole of the file system on block layer as such. And then networking at the network layer in socket layer, uh, TCP IP layer, as well as at the device driver layer like related to interrupts and as such. And then the other subsystems like the schedule or memory management virtual memory. So, so to get to know what is happening at each of the subsystems, the uh, BPF uh, uh, events, the BPF programs can be attached to those this is subsystems as such. And um, uh, with the help of this support BPF tracing support, Multiple uh, means the means which which provides the multiple sources of events as such, and that will provide the visibility to the entire software stack. And this uh, uh, visibility uh, we can get in by making use of the different uh, instrumentation ways as such. So basically, the instrumentation that's a dynamic instrumentation and static instrumentation, and that too as a kernel level and at the user level as such. So basically, when uh, instrumentation is happening at the user space level, it uh, makes use of this U probe uh, functionality, and uh, means that that's a dynamic uh, instrumentation. The dyna when you say instrument, the dynamic instrumentation means uh, the uh, instrument the code instrumentation is done at the runtime as such and the live code as such. Okay. So. Uh, with the dynamic instrumentation, it provides the ability to insert the instrumentation points into the up and running code as such. And uh, for the kernel, the K proof functionality has been used. And for the user space, um, and that is done in the, with, uh, with the help of this U, U probes func functionality. And the uh, dynamic instrumentation that can be used to instrument the uh, at the starting or end of the kernel function or the application function as such. You can add the probes uh, at the, the, these different points as such. And of course, not only start end, or you can also add this uh, before probe at some offset of the function as well as such. And uh, as this uh, di as uh, dynamic instrumentation, you would go and uh, attach to some particular kernel function as such. And this kernel function API, is, API might change from version to version as such. So that's why we, uh, that's why it's been said that the kernel probes uh, does not uh, does not provide uh, quite a stable uh, API. I mean, it would change as per the kernel version if the API definite declaration definition changes as such. Whereas in case of uh, static instrumentation, the instrumentation points are, uh, are uh, added in the code itself and they're maintained by the developers as such. And um, for, for the kernel, uh, those are been uh, implemented using the trace points, which the code, which support has been added since uh, 2.6 32 kernel. And for the user space, another uh, uh, that is the form that is provided through this uh, user statically defined trace points as such. And uh, again, the instrumentation can be done in the kernel and the user applications. And uh, as they are being implemented or added by the developers, they are kind of provide a stable um, API interface as such. Okay. So 
what we as for our topic, what we are going to look at is the kernel instrumentation that is uh, uh, dynamic as well as static, uh, that is through the key probes and the trace points. As soon as my focus is around this uh, uh, framework as such, functionality as such. So what we will do is we'll first look at the uh, key probes. K-probes is the framework functionality that allows to set the hooks at, uh, at any or almost any function or instruction in the kernel code. And uh, uh, basically, uh, and, uh, basically the EBIP programs, they are attached using uh, the K-probes that is particularly for the entry of the functions or at the specific offset of the function after the entry as on. And uh, there are different ways that can be done through the BPF or BCC. We'll come to this, what this BCC and BPF tools are there. And these are just to give an idea that what are the functions that are being used. And basically also uh, dynamic instrumentation uh, can be done through the k, uh, k return probes that is, that, is the, that is attached at the exit of the function. So uh, when you attach the program to that, a particular event uh, entry as an exit exit function. So uh, uh, through this k written flows, you can collect the information when when you're exiting from the function as such. Now we are in this example, like to take an example like a VFS read or the read read system call. Like in the case of read, what we expect is the the output of the read uh, is the number of bytes that has been read. So for particular uh, analysis for, uh, as such, you might want to know that application, uh, what kind of read load is happening as such, or overall system load that is happening through the read operation. So in that case, um, uh, this written, written probe, K written probe, um, can be used to collect and collect the uh, red number of bytes read. That is the exit, the, which at the exit point, the kernel code path is aware of that, the how much read has happened as such. And then accordingly, particularly in this example, it is doing the work of um, collecting the VFS read function that is executing, executed throughout the system and uh, this, uh, Display uh, displaying the histogram for the read operations that are happening as such. Okay. So we'll come to the syntax. How what is that uh, in the later examples? But this is just to give an idea. Like uh, at the uh, uh, basically uh, K proofs at the entry. Like another example here. Example I've taken is the open system call. So open system call, like if some security has to be enforced in this case, uh, uh, some security tool has been developed and you are trying to monitor or enforce the security as such. In that case, um, you can add the uh, hooks at this uh, open system call. And if a particular file has not to be opened by a particular set of users, then in that case, in that uh, BPO program, you could have a functionality. Okay, this is the file which comes as the first parameter to the open system call. And then uh, corresponding, as you are in the kernel, you have the pointer to the task that is running. So from that, you can uh, get the credential of that particular task uh, uh, and the process uh, and uh, have some, based on that policy, decide if, that open has to succeed or not. Or you can just uh, do the work of collecting that information for further analysis as a login purpose, like monitor what is things happening around uh, uh, on the system at that particular time as such. So that's where this probe, uh, probe can be used for collecting the information at the start of the function. So here in this case function, now here in this case you will look, this do sys open is the function particularly uh, corresponding to the open system call. And here we are not using the sys open as such, but the inside function of the system call as such. So here in, in this case, it's not just restricted to the system calls, but 
any function, uh, kernel function can be you can be proved as such. Means the PPO program can be attached to any function. So we'll come come to this. What is a BPF trace in a couple of slides next as such. So basically, uh, using these K probes means uh, for debugging and for performance, developers can write the kernel models and attach the function to the K probes or use make use of the tools as such or write the BPF programs all together for performing the operation. So this uh, K probes is for dynamic instrumentation. Now, what we will look at is the uh, static instrumentation in the kernel that is done through the uh, trace points. So trace point is the functionality, kernel functionality that uh, allows you to insert the code at a logical places uh, while implementing that functionality. May maybe you're implementing the driver as such. In that case, um, you, uh, the developer, as a developer, you would might use the trace point for some of the functionality as such. So in that case, the developer is adding the uh, adding the static markers into the kernel code path as such. And you can list uh, list down this what are the different trace points that are there on your system that is created by looking into this file as such available events as such. Okay, so if you look at that, then. That is tracing available events. Not that's right. So if you look at that, there are uh, there are there are uh, the trace points being added by the different subsystems. Maybe in this case, you see this NF, uh, NFS and related uh, uh, subsystem, and this is the RF, uh, RFS. This 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 code has been added by the different maintainer with different code maintainers or the device drivers as such. Well. And again, you get to see the trace uh, trace points being added for the system call. I just gave it, taken the snapshot of some of the system calls uh, that has the trace points. So the trace from this, like the trace points are there at the exit and entry as a, this is about the this is trace point at the exit of the clone system call, entry of the clone system call, and similarly for the fork and V fork as such. Okay. So basically, like if you do, it can count on how many kinds, how many the trace points are there available on the system as well. So here in this case, I am having a bit older kernel that is five dot four kernel. So on five dot four kernel, it, it, uh, currently there are like 15, 1500 plus. Uh, uh, trace points uh, present in that kernel as such. So basically, uh, what we can do is like um, use the trace points, static uh, trace points to collect the information as such. Okay. So here in this example, we'll go through the example later as such. But here I've just pointed out the example uh, for the read system call as such. So whenever the read system call, entry of the read system call happens, uh, just go and print the um, count that is the input parameter for the read system count. So here in this case, it would uh, print the number of bytes that has to be read. Um, then here in this case, the constraint term that the uh, process should be SSD as such. So here in this case, we get the information about the process, the uh, SSD process doing performing different kinds of. Uh, uh, and doing the reads with the n number of bytes that as such. Okay. So, uh, so to get started with how to use that uh, interfaces, we'll look at this um, uh, BPF tool chain as such. So basically, uh, uh, in, in the uh, in lot of scenarios or in the current scenarios, as uh, the EPBF framework or the programs, they are not directly used as such, but they are indirectly been used uh, via projects such as BCC, BPF Trace, or CDM project as such. So this project provides a, a more abstraction, uh, provides an abstraction on top of the, uh, the 
for BBA framework and uh, abstraction in form of tools and script as such. So you don't need to write the program programs directly as such. Let's do, start with this, like you can use this program uh, scripts and tools provided by this project. And if they satisfy the requirement, then that is good. But if you have more a customized requirement, then you should go and write your own programs as much. So basically you're, um, and this, this is not limited to the, these two frameworks, with, but these are the most prominently used front ends for the BPF tracing that is a, uh, BPF compiler collection, BCC, and the BPF traced uh, uh, framework as well. And the BPF programs, they can be written uh, either in the C pseudo C code, Lua, uh, Go, lang Go, uh, Go language, or Python as such. And the set of helper functions, they are provided through this lib, uh, BPF library. And this code is compiled to bytecode uh, using the LLVM and the C line compiler. And the, the way you can start is like if you're looking for the tools to run, then you start with the BCC tools and then go for the uh, go with the BPF tool as such if you're doing more customization. And if you want to write your own customized uh, evaluation or adding code or customizing based on the requirement, then in that case, um, start with the BPF trace, uh, which provides the high level language kind of interface, and then uh, uh, write your own uh, BCC programs. As so most of the programs that are there, like CDM or the other tools, open source tools are there. So some of them, they use a combination of BPF trace and they own BCC programs as such. Most of the uh, hardware acceleration or network acceleration, uh, it's a customized requirement that would be done by writing their own BCC programs, BPF programs as such. So this B BCC uh, is a collection, collection or framework that enables to write the program, uh, write a Python program uh, and embed the BPF program inside then the example that we saw as such. And uh, the running the Python program basically generates the bytecode and uh, that loads into the kernel. It's basically the BCC framework handles the work of converting the program, C, C like program or pseudo C program that into bytecode and load into the kernel. And at the back end, the BPF system call is executed, it would load, the, or load this uh, BPF program onto the kernel as such. So basically it is useful for some complex tooling or the given kind of application. And BPF trace is a high level tracing language uh, with, uh, which is like uh, compatible or inspired by ARC and C uh, uh, language interface. So it provides that kind of interface and then um, it uses LLVM as a backend to compile the scripts into a bytecode as such and load and for loading and interacting with the kernel, the, uh, the BCC framework has been used as such. And they, it provides the like one liner kind of uh, interfaces, something like we have seen in the previous example. So this is, and this is the BPF trace tool that uh, uh, is, this whole of this syntax is been it's uh, it's been convert it it does the work of uh, converting into a code that would be loaded into the kernel and then executing as such right? through the help of this one liner syntax as such even though you can write a small syntax short script as such so there are some syntax syntax and primitives that is to based on some pertaining to BCC and some uh, syntax formation for the BPF trace as such. So this is again a slide from Greg Gerberg. Uh, it's uh, uh, talking, uh, showcasing the uh, different tools that are part of this BCC project as such. Okay. So your uh, uh, BCC, let me say, yeah. So these are the uh, these this uh, these uh, these are the repos that are uh, from which we get the 
BCCN, um, BF, BBF trace as such. And uh, all these tools, they are, uh, yeah, go ahead. Don't think there was a question. Is somebody, this question for Vandana? Doesn't look like it, Vandana. Keep okay. So you're, um, like, if you look at this thing, so you would see that uh, we can go and look at each of these subsystem and this information from each of the subsystem is collected by making use of these different tools as such. So uh, as a beginner, what you can do is you can start with using these tools that help you to get the understanding of what is happening at each of the subsystem as such. And then as you get comfortable with that, then go and implement through the um, programming interface as such. So what I'll do is I, I plan to take some of the this tool to demonstrate and then see what are what are we getting out of this as such. So here for let's look at some of the system call interface as such. So here what the system call interface in this case is these are some of the tools that are uh, come for uh, that uh, particularly interacts with the system call interface. And here the example I would take is the open snow, uh, which which the tool that that pro shows the process. Uh, basically, it uh, tries to show uh, which processes are opening uh, which files as such. And this this uh, tool can be useful for like if some application is failing or if there is some misconfiguration, then in that case, this this could provide some pointers as such. Similarly, there is a stat snoop. It does the work of snooping or tracing the different uh, trace stat system calls as the variants of stat system calls. And which would help you to understand like which process trying to uh, attend or reading, trying to read some uh, information about which files are such. And again, you can do the snooping with the help of the uh, uh, exact snoop, which does the work of monitoring or snooping the exact system calls. So, like um, if you now. Okay, we run the application and this tool opens no. So it prints the information like process ID, command, uh, there's a name, file descriptor, if there is some error in that, and the path which the file has been opened. So here in this case, this, this is generating load for the whole of the system as such. So one of the uh, things that you can look up is this, the identity just for the explanation purpose. IRQ balance. So IRQ balance is a is a is a daemon that does the work of interrupt uh, interrupt load balancing as such. So and basically it does that goes and checks into the uh, SMB affinity file for balancing the load across multiple CPUs as such. So this is activity that is happening in the background as such done by the IRQ balance. So we just goes and open these files and does. Um, Whatever the operation. So right now we are you are looking with the open snoop is just what are the files that are getting opened by what which process this process name the ID and the path and again like if there are any other errors that would be shown under this column as such and this is the file descriptor uh, uh, ID as such. Okay. Similarly, uh, uh, like uh, we have this start snoop as the case. Uh, Now here, this hyphen BFC that particularly means that it's a BCC tool as such. So here in this case, like here, uh, I, now right, my mind system is just a virtual machine as such and nothing um, great or anything workload has been generated as such, but based on the application, uh, whatever the testing or some debugging or performance analysis you're doing, then in that case, while well, that application is workload is generated, these tools can help 
understand the, the, some of the dynamics going on with that application as well. And similarly, we have this exact, exact snoop will give you like, since it does not like only performance related, but also like uh, from the security, if the security appliances uh, tends to understand that which process is trying to execute uh, the binaries and all this. And so for, from a security point of view, this, kind of, this interface is quite helpful to track all the, um, now here in this case, there's uh, uh, some of the demos they might be running in the background, so that is printed. But some up, some uh, some application is running particularly that can be monitored, like in that case, uh, or from the security security tools are there. What are things going on? Then can, all that can be tech, uh, taken uh, looked at or logged at when the exact system call is going as such. Okay. So here I am, what I'm doing is first just going with the uh, understanding of tools and then we will do the same thing with the, uh, with the examples as such, with the programming example. Okay. Then similarly for the file system, uh, particularly like uh, there are other other tools like file top is particularly used to uh, trace the file read writes as such and it prints the memory and basically uh, at the, uh, the tool what it does is like it is particularly tracing the vfs related functions as such particularly the actual kernel function that is a vfs read and we have sprite that they are been using the dynamic tracing as such And it, uh, what it does, it, uh, it uh, prints the um, reads and writes as such. So basically it is a VFS read and VFS write and the read and write workload as such. Um, basically it does the sort, sorting based on the amount of data that has been read as such. And it's been in the default interval of one second that you can change it as such. Okay, so that helps to give uh, gives an understanding like where actually the system is getting utilized and what kind of operation is happening. And similarly, we have this VF, um, what is that VFS count and VFS stat is basically used to, for uh, getting an idea of general workload characterization that is happening. And if you want to know like what all the VFS really functionalities are getting executed in those. This VFS count basically traces all the kernel functions that are starting beginning with VFS underscore. So basically all the functions that are part of the VFS subsystem as such. So all this thing is uh, which prints this VFS count. To as such, so here in this case, it prints this information as such. The that uh, this particular VFS function is called so many times. So this would give us the idea, like if the system is uh, under load as such, or what what is really causing a blockage, and what which are the which of the kernel code has been more used or executing that can be traced by making use of things. If it is particular file system load or a block IO load. Uh, going through the file system, then this is one of the interface that provides this information as such. And VFS start is like it uh, traces some common uh, functions like read, write, sync, and as such. Okay. Another area that uh, 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 we can look at uh, from the uh, by using the uh, tool is the scheduler. Of course, like. Uh, from the performance point or when the system at higher load and is there, then scheduler is one of the key component as such that helps you to know like exactly which are the processes that are getting, uh, that are executing what the, they are been getting the time slot and who are been starved or as such. So here in this case, the one of the tool is the CPU distribution tool CPU that does the work of measuring the time the task the process spends on the CPU before getting descheduled. And basically it internally it uses the uh, some type of BPF maps 
and uh, which stores that information and it prints the information in a form of a histogram as such. So this, with the help of this tool, basically it helps the, uh, like to find, like, suppose like a task is spending short time on the CPU. So that uh, kind of information is an indication uh, of like, uh, there might be a multiple excessive context switching has happening or the workload distribution is not, uh, uh, it is purely poorly been done as such that gives, that can, that can be estimated by looking at the information that uh, as such are uh, possibly that can be the reason that the logs are being held as a uh, possibility of the contention of the resources as such like the some process has acquired the mutex and then the, another process trying to acquire the same mutex and as the lock is not been uh, available there there's chances the, applic the other application is just contact switching a lot many times as such so that's why the application is not getting the CPU. So uh, information can be derived based on the stats collected from this. Also like the task is not spending off time more that before it is getting scheduled as such. So that can happen that the task might be waiting for the IO to completion or a long um, IO is happening as such. So, so on this we can derive the information to know the health of the system as such. And uh, all this information uh, for collecting this information, storing it uses this uh, internal BAPs uh, for storing the timestamp and the histograms as such. And uh, yeah, this year, this is one of the examples like where there can be uh, more, may incur the overheads for some kind of loads because here these traces, uh, it goes and traces the scheduler trace point. So uh, there can be extensive load uh, uh, or red create by this kind of uh, tracing, um, tra string events generated in the scheduler as such. So it, it, it runs in the background and creates a histogram as such. So here in this case, it um, it is displaying in the information how the CPU distribution is happening through this time timestamp. Another one is that we can look at is the virtual memory as such. Um, one of the major concerns with that to have uh, utilization of memory, like if the memory is available or not, and then that can be traced with the memory leak uh, for the memory allocation allocation request. And what it does, it, it collects these stack traces, stacks for the allocation that happens, and then brings a summary, like which stack uh, called stack perform the allocation that has not yet been freed. From that uh, information, you get to know the health of the memory allocation that is happening. So basically, you can trace the memory leaks for a particular process by specifying the uh, input parameters. That is a specific PID. In that case, the it lists the function from the libc that is malloc, calloc, and the related memory management functions. And you can use it for tracing the whole processes. So in that case, it goes into more of a kernel function, the like KML or uh, um, uh, kernel allocation APIs as such, uh, along with the page allocations itself. Okay. So here, uh, like this list is quite extensive and actually like if you get to go and study each of this, it's like you get to get into the details uh, details of every aspect of the kernel subsystems as such. It's extensive and very incredible resource information we get from this. So, um, Vandana, you have about five minutes left, and then I'm yeah. not sure okay. how many slides you have. Um, and do you want uh, to? Okay, I'll, 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 okay, should I take questions? questions? Well. Yes. Yeah, okay. okay. So, the question in the QA box is uh, uh, Can eBPF be used in Init RAM FS? In a tram FS, uh, yeah, I think that should be able to be used because uh, BPO framework uh, the, that's part of the kernel. 
So in the in a drama, first uh, you tend to load the kernel modules and do some other basic functionality at the time of when. But I think that by that time, the BPF framework should be available. But would you be able to kick off? You won't be able to kick off a user process at that point, though, right? Uh, user process uh, would not be kicked. No, in it, uh, RAM FS. Um, so uh, through the init ram FS, you have been able to load the module, uh, kernel module that is you do you you, you uh, do through in small or prob pro, 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 pro as such. So right, basically, right. so right. you're basically we're using BPF trace tool as such. Like if you do if you tend to use BPF trace, then I think we should be able to do that functionality. Or even BPF uh, applic uh, programs been written to be. This is the interface I think that should be able to be done. Because the, we, we are at a point that the kernel is uh, up and running and then you're loading the file system or uh, any such components, but the functionality is up and running. So through BPF trace or BCC tools, I think that would be that should be able to be done, executed at the init RAM FS. I think some of the application might have that need as well. It's and you early... have to make that part of the init RAM FS. Um, right, yes. Right. Not, not at the command line, of course. Right, right, right. yes. Okay, so that is um, great. That's one. Um, uh, okay, let me see. Answered live. Let me get rid of that. Since it has ability to monitor the processes and virtual memory, I think it has ability to tamper the memory data uh, well, yes right? yes means it, uh, you should be able to do that means uh, if you are attaching to those kernel functions as such so uh, memory dumping uh, would not be a very good way through the system um, through the bpf but the information related to memory functionality would be good as such but of course you can dump that but there are other interfaces provided for dumping the memory as such because like it, it would be how much amount of memory you want to dump us because the uh, BPF map or the trace pipe, it would have a limited size limitation as such. But, that, but if you define, if you def I think if you define your own BPF map functionality, then I think in that case, you should be able to do that. It's not a raw memory dump, but some way to pass on that memory. Okay. memory contents. Okay, there is one question that might uh, be a good one to answer. Can the eBBF program store state or does it simply pass data back and we need to build state in user space? So uh, the data that is available, like so by default, if you're using the kernel buffer, uh, that is a perf buff, then in that case, once it is passed, it is emptied, but other case, it is there in the maps as such. But once it is accessed, I think uh, it gets flushed from the kernel store as such. Okay, so user space has to, once they obtain the data, user space has to keep track of the state. And yes, that, yes. yes, that would make right. sense because yes. these are, these are, uh, um, these are uh, uh, runtime ring buffers, event, and yeah. buffers go yes, anyway. Yes, um, yeah. Overflow buffers. Yes, right. Okay. I think there are other questions. Um, however, we are out of time. Um, okay. Candace, yeah. um, would oh, I th think that, yes, we are kind of, uh, it, it's why at time now, 10 30, I mean, 30 minutes. The hour. So do you have any more slides, uh, Vandana? Um, uh, I think I had some examples as such, but it's there in the slides, like um, it can be referred on the, going through the main co co concepts and these things I've covered as such. Okay, uh, Candace, I'll throw it back to you. 
Thank you, Vandana and Shua for your time today. And thank you everyone for joining us. As a reminder, this recording will be on the Linux Foundation's YouTube page later today, and a copy of the presentation slides will be added to the Linux Foundation's website. We hope you are able to join us for future mentorship sessions. Have a wonderful day. Thank you guys.